Hello, and welcome to the 11th episode of Honest Discussions. I'm your host, Dr. Raymond Patterson. And today we're going to be talking to Dr. Gal Vishne, who recently graduated from the Computational Neuroscience Department at the Edmund and Lily Safra Center for Brain Sciences in Israel. Uh, her paper, which was in Cell recently, uh, really goes far into increasing our understanding of how conscious recognition works, what parts of the brain are involved in conscious recognition, and is really starting to tease apart the mechanisms by which consciousness goes from recording sensory experience to experience. And there's a big difference between just sensing something and actually having it come into your consciousness. We discuss her paper in detail, as well as the philosophy of consciousness, what the current thinking is on how consciousness forms, what areas of the brain are involved. Uh, it's a really fascinating discussion, and uh, I hope you enjoy it as much as I did, because as always, I learned a ton. And if you enjoy listening to this content, please like, share, subscribe. Channel is still growing, and uh, every little click helps. We're still trying to get that thousand followers, and you could be a part of that process. And if you decide to sign up, we really appreciate it. And on that note, on with the show. So I'm a graduate student in the Hebrew University, and I study computational neuroscience. Um, so I can say that I got to that sort of um, as a, like my BA is in uh, mathematics, and I really resonate. There's a philosopher David Chalmers that he also started this path in mathematics, and then uh, at least he he wrote in his book that he just found at some point um, that his mind was being occupied by thoughts about the mind where mathematics should have been. And then he understood that he needs to switch a field. And I really resonate with that. I did love mathematics. It was really interesting. I still, I wanted to still have some relation to it. And that's how I got to computational neuroscience. But I just found out that I'm thinking that I go to sleep with deep questions about completely different issues. Um, and I had friends and, and so that were more entrenched in the mathematics per se. And I thought, I love this, but I want to, to do something that I think about all the time. And this is not it. Like um, something applied. Um, so applied, but also I think exactly because mathematics in science, it's a bit isolated. If you do abstract mathematics, you're kind of not doing anything else. You don't really care. People maybe use your tool sometimes if you're a bit more on the applied side in mathematics. And I really wanted to do something. I mean, I was interested by physics and biology and psychology and philosophy. And I, I, I wanted to find somewhere where they all mix. Um, and so that's how I got to computational neuroscience and behavioral modeling. I really also wanted to do something like get a, maybe tools that I had for mathematics and get them applied to the social sciences. Do you like um, really hard questions, clearly? Yeah, exactly. And then within heart. that, <laughs> then I, I thought, what's the hardest question I can apply now with these tools? Then I, I, I got into consciousness studies. Yeah, I also gravitated towards the hardest questions, you know, trying to understand huge networks. You know, I would love, I still think it's possible to model cells like all of it, but especially with the computational power we have now, but I don't have the team behind me to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so you get into this consciousness area for mathematics, and clearly you would have had to take a lot of did you get into a lot of neuroscience courses or yeah so my program it how it works that's also why i found it very appropriate for my case because i knew i loved popular science but i knew i didn't have the the background in academic biology or psychology and so this program is really about you do one and a half two years of intense courses just like in your ba 
and then only you continue to lapse. So I got to experience a very broad range of things. And at that point, I started exactly, I realized that I love this. They had courses in theoretical um, neuroscience, which is really theoretical physics uh, and biology and math for those who didn't have it and some psychology, but there was no philosophy course in the program. So I realized that something, it, it's also sometimes when something is missing, it makes you realize how much you want it. Um, so I started taking philosophy courses myself, um, just because I was already in the university, you go, you sign up, and I loved it. So I took philosophy of mind. Uh, even before that, in my BA, I took philosophy of science. I started hanging out with philosophers, exactly working on these issues on cognition. Um, and that's when I found out that there's a lab uh, in my university, um, Leon de Wael's lab, that does uh, researches a lot of things, but also uh, interested in consciousness. And I thought that's where I want to be. I might not end up even doing work that's directly on it. I kind of got lucky in the end that a study that's not necessarily about consciousness became so relevant to the consciousness de uh, debate. But I thought I want to be in a place where uh, this interest in philosophy and this uh, breadth, all these ideas uh, are welcomed and not uh, shunned. Um, and so that's how I got to it, more or less. Well, we're going to have a great discussion then because I agree that philosophy has kind of been shoved out of the way in almost all scientific disciplines. I mean, I've spoken with physicists that would argue that philosophy is the bane of physics and that even though we get degrees, quote unquote, as doctors of philosophy, that's not really our job. And I couldn't feel farther distant from that concept. Like, no, philosophy is super important. And especially when you get into consciousness, it's really important. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, so I really resonate with that. I think uh, I think philosophy is important in other cases too. Sometimes just to understand how your in, in, the natural progress of science is going on. There is a good work on that. There is a, a Thomas Kuhn or Karl Popper, if we go way back. Um, that I, I think for me, just reading them and, and studying about them helped me understand how this process goes on. And then I think especially in everywhere around cognition or neuroscience, there's a lot of work being done today in modern philosophy about neuroscience and concepts like representation and things like that. And then when you get into consciousness, that's, you have everything. You have re recent work and everything going back 2,000, 3,000 years. And I just, I really wanted to have that mix. I still think we have to specialize in how we do things today. So I don't really, I, I mean, I even... I do work with philosophers and I have co-edited, for example, a book that's uh, philosophy proper, but I don't regard myself as a philosopher. I'm, I'm an author maybe with some inclination towards it. And I'm working now on a, another paper that's pure philosophy, but still I think there's a lot of uh, specialization and I just uh, benefit a lot from these interactions, from having philosophers and talking to them. Sometimes it's directly related to my neuroscience work because of consciousness, uh, but sometimes it's not and it, it diverges to other things and I still learn a lot from the process. So what is the uh, uh, current thought of what is consciousness? And I, it is <laughs> such a hard question to answer, but from your perspective, what is the modern thinking on what consciousness actually is, or are we still in an area where it's just, we don't know? Well, I think it's it's not that and not that. I think there's many people and many ideas out there and definitions out there. So many people are saying, I know. So as a field, there's no consensus. I can't really say in, in quickly, just define it in one term, but many people will tell you things. So maybe I'll just give a few examples of things. So the sure. classical definitions are a, consciousness is what it is be, to be a, a, like to, to have a certain feelings, to be a certain being. So um, there's a famous paper by uh, Thomas Nagel, uh, what it's like to be a bat that's about consciousness. So it's just, it's a feeling of more than just doing automatic things. There's something going on. You, when you see a color and when I see uh, now the screen around you, I'm having all these experiences. So really consciousness is this experience, this uh, um, in, uh, I don't know, you kind of what's going on inside your head that you, you have. Self-awareness? 
So that's also related, but I think all of this is really still very vague, and I'm sure I even butchered some definitions now when I said it. And I think the academic work on it did have some, managed to get to some useful distinctions that get things uh, going. So a lot of people, for example, when they think about consciousness, also in the most applied sense, you have patients, for example, that are in a coma. So you could be alive but not conscious. Or every night when you go to sleep, you're uh, not conscious. You in, in your dreams, you are, are sometimes. Most of the time, you're not. Um, so uh, there's, of course, uh, uh, dead uh, not, uh, and alive, but I think more specific than that. So sleep, so a uh, coma. Uh, today, when people start talking about AI or very young babies or an, an, a political debates in the States about a, a abortion, for example. So and all of these I would put under a states of consciousness. So it's either like whether the entire being is conscious or not, or just the entire state, but not something specific about what you're the specific experience. So this is part of the study on it. And I think this is where the work is getting to be most applied uh, because you do have work, uh, for example, on deciding whether someone is a locked in syndrome, which is a neurological syndrome where people don't react, but they still have consciousness um, or various states of coma. So there's still um, a lot of debates. I think that's where it's most crucial to be very careful from drawing from unsubstantiated uh, theories or from things that are only half cooked because this has actual implications now. And the other side, which is a lot closer to what I work on, is uh, what people call content consciousness. So what is going on in my brain when I have a specific experience? And right now I'm looking at you, I'm looking at a face. This looks differently. It's not just the processing that I'm not aware of. This looks differently than when I'm I don't know, looking at a watch. And something in my brain has to correspond to this difference. So this uh, is uh, a lot of the scientific work on consciousness in the last two or three decades was really about this question, which is not about awake or asleep, but it's about why am I now aware of seeing a face versus seeing something else. Um, and so consciousness was really not a scientific topic for many years. I think it's Roughly, it's pretty much a consensus that we need to credit uh, Christoph Koch and Francis Crick from uh, Watson and Crick that uh, discovered the, the structure of DNA. So Crick was a neuroscientist and near the end of his career, he started getting more and more interested. And he, together with Christoph Koch, really helped legitimize this topic. And they made a very precise definition for the neural correlates of consciousness. Sometimes people just call it NCC. And that means the set of neural mechanisms that are together necessary and sufficient. So both of these conditions for any one specific content. And then a lot of the theories and a lot of the work is finding the NCC for viewing faces, for example. And that's where my work gets in. So when it comes to the neural correlates of consciousness, just to dumb it down a little bit, for lack of a better term, what we're really talking about is that the we're looking for the paths of neurons that are activated in response to what we're visualizing. And then those, how those neurons work to create the experience. So there's exactly. a difference between the experience and the recognition. Would yes. that be fair? Yes. Um, I think, well, I know mean, recognition is is a bit is a word that's a bit already tied, I think, to consciousness. But definitely, there's processing that's going on with is view visual neurons, like neurons that are related to sight, that is not related to consciousness. I think you can go even more extreme. For example, just for these neurons to give me the experience, or to give you also the experience of looking at a face, you, you have to have you have to be awake. If you're asleep and something is put in front of you, it won't work. And so there are some background conditions, but we're not talking about that. So this is all unconscious, just changing your state. What we really care about is the specific neurons that are related to the specific content that I'm looking at. So what areas of the brain do you look for consciousness? Do you look in all areas of the brain? I mean, I know in your study, you look at a, a subset, but in general, when you look for consciousness, do you look in all areas of the brain? Is it thought that all areas participate in the conscious experience? 
Uh, so that's a really good question. And also we said consciousness, especially these days, is very, very debated among many, many scholars that each of them has their own definitions. They're also their fa different favorite brain region, I think. So maybe I will I will narrow it down a bit. So I think in general, there's more consensus. People do look more at the cortex. So that's that big chunk of the brain that's around the, the nuclei uh, that give you basic functions like breathing or things like that. Um, and then there is a lot of theories and a lot of emphasis on the prefrontal cortex, and maybe we'll get to it. And then a um, more a broad talk about pretty much everything else, but it is related to the specific modality. So for example, usually I think uh, most people that are talking, for example, now we, we discuss visual consciousness, being aware of a specific face. So they will go look in visual areas. So the debate is more like sensory areas more, versus more executive high order areas. Sometimes this includes more auto parietal cortex that's around here. And, and the most intense debate has been about the prefrontal cortex. So these are the, the two directions. And I think the most interesting theories and where I personally stand is somewhere in the interaction think that it's not just here or just here, but maybe they do have specialized roles that they, they can't be interchangeable. But to be aware, I might need something from uh, the sensor regions and something from the prefrontal regions. But this is not necessarily, I, I do want to emphasize that my study maybe starts suggesting something in that direction, but it's definitely not a direct outcome of it, which I think is really important also when we're talking to about the public, um, to, the, to the public. Because studies today, I mean, I think it's true pretty much anywhere. A single study will tell you very little. And what's important a lot of times, and this is also why we get the divide that people do require more and more background, but it's more important to what talk it generates with other scientists and what it's related to. So from my study, I don't you really can't know. I do work and I show something in the prefrontal cortex and I show things in central regions. Um, so it, it's suggestive that these two are related, but it, it doesn't have to be that way. It's not a direct outcome. Well, we're going to get to that, but I th there's lots of studies showing that there's integration, that there's integration from many, if not all, parts of the brain. And I'm just curious, actually, as a side note, like, what about the glands that are in the brain, which are you know, releasing the various neurochemicals, which then change conscious experience. And we know this for a fact. So, you know, shouldn't those also be investigated for a role in consciousness like the pituitary gland? I think that's absolutely correct. Uh, so I don't know if you mentioned the pituitary gland has a history here because of its role for a, a Descartes, but maybe we'll get to that. I think it, on, on, I want to have two answers for that. First, yes, you're correct. And I think there is a trend in in, in the uh, scientific community on looking more and more on regions like the thalamus and things like that. Um, but I also want to go back to this definition from uh, Crick and Koch that was um, very precise about saying that you're looking at the correlate for this specific experience and not something that's just in general changing your state. So I think people looking into sleep research, for example, should and, and are indeed very much invested in these nuclei and uh, all these subcortical regions. Um, but uh, a lot of times we, we already know from their work, for example, that this is more like a general on and off switch. And then you're like, okay, let's assume it's on and what, what happens afterwards? Why am I aware now of a face and not of something else, um, of a tissue, a plant, whatever. Um, so I think but even after this, I do think there's a trend towards understanding that there's still specific interaction with these regions. I've seen things specifically about the thalamus, but I'm sure there's more. And that might they might contribute to the neural correlates of consciousness too. Well, but also memory, because if you have no memory, how would you even know if you were conscious? So that's a really interesting question. I did... Um, so I, I, maybe you know there's this famous patient called HM, um, that uh, many years ago, about um, more than 50 years ago, had both of these hippocampus on both sides removed because he had very severe epilepsy. And back then they didn't know that this was going to cause very, very severe problems. Um, and so after, he woke up after the surgery and he could no longer uh, generate new memories. So for example, the researcher that afterwards worked with him for decades had to introduce herself every time. And it, it's debated how long exactly was that window that he had memory there. Uh, but I did hear uh, people that um, 
I just read all the study about him, and I think even once someone that did actually talk to him speculate that he was still conscious, that, um, that you don't have to have at least not rich memory to be conscious. Um, but I think this is also something that people look into now. Well, but if you had, I'm saying no memory. So he had, let's say that that person had never recorded a memory. The only reason that you could say that, you know, he's conscious, it says he had pre-recorded memories stored elsewhere. And I think that memory is probably stored everywhere. I even think that memory may be a quantum phenomena and stored in a quantum computer. The thing, computer stored everywhere is, is very much backed by the mainstream neuroscientific research. These structures, the hippocampus that he had removed are about generating new memories, which is where he failed. So I think it definitely, you're, you're right. He did have some memory. Um, I think that's an interesting question. I don't know. I think he's, I mean, a, a creature that has absolutely no memory. Um, I don't know if I would say that necessarily it's not conscious. It definitely has less rich and varied consciousness because we have all these uh, connotations and we can think a lot more in a lot more details and reminisce and, and nostalgia, etc. But I'm not sure that it would deprive this creature of consciousness completely. Well, let's just keep going down this path for just a second because then take it all the way down to bacteria. Are bacteria conscious? Well, they do have, I mean, they do have some type of sensory memory. So could they be, I mean, this is always the area of consciousness that I love because really you ask an average person, is your dog conscious? They're going to say, yes, your dog is absolutely conscious. And then you go to a fish and people are going to be like, well, yeah, fish are conscious because they hunt and they do things. So they're conscious. Well, if you take that all the way back to, you know, you now go to slime mold right at the interface of single to multicellular. Well, there are cheater cells in slime molds that can always make it to the, to the, uh, to the end of the stock so that they get sporulated and get to carry on. So, and that's through this cyclic AMP mechanism. So, are they conscious? Well, maybe. And then take it down to the single cell. The single cell, the single cell amoeba still hunts. The single cell amoeba still hides from predators. So they have some type of working memory. And then is it consciousness? That's really, I, I love this overview because it's really comprehensive and, and you're kind of, doing a very good job in diving directly into the main controversy. Um, I think, so we, we have to acknowledge that you can do a lot of complex behaviors without being conscious. You can see that in humans as well. I, I think I mentioned earlier breathing. Breathing has a lot of things going on. And you have various reflexes. Your eyes, for example, follow moving objects without a meaning to, and that's that doesn't require to be conscious of what you're doing. Um, so, but it's, this is still doesn't mean that all these um, um, maybe uh, um, smaller animals that you mentioned with maybe less uh, developed brains like the one that we do that do all these complicated actions, maybe they're still conscious. The fact that, and people are working really hard to try to map very specific behaviors and see what type of maybe complex uh, behavior you have to do that does require consciousness they try to exactly starting with delineating with within humans what are more reflexes and what actions you require to have consciousness and then at least as an analog start thinking okay then let's investigate dogs first and then uh, uh, smaller animals even and then uh, i heard a talk recently in the recent uh, conference of the assc the association for the scientific study of consciousness they, there's a group in London that's working really hard on bees, uh, trying to show that they have all these sophisticated behaviors that at least we agree in humans that are conscious. Um, and I think it's really interesting. I, I don't know enough to have a very definitive opinion about it, but I think it's definitely, it requires continued uh, work. Well, on the bees, I am of the opinion that they have collective consciousness. I would argue that humans do as well. I don't think Young was completely out of his mind. There's too many things that happen. Uh, and that I, if, if you're on this planet long enough, you will have an instance as a, as a scientist, you will have an instance where 
days after you come up with the most ingenious idea, the greatest idea that's ever been had, you're going to talk to somebody across the, the world that all of a sudden they've had the same idea too. And it's within the same, you know, relative time span. I mean, collective consciousness is not proven, but it's certainly very difficult to disprove as well. I think that's true. And I think that that also applies for a lot of other questions in consciousness, because uh, you could say the same about the bees or about many other things about a uh, various, a uh, very young babies about AI, that it's still, it's very, very hard to go both, both to prove and disprove something is really, really hard. Um, because really there's just one uh, example, a model that we know that is conscious and that's humans. And even that's not precise. I know that I'm conscious. I have to take a leap of faith. Uh, it's called the other body problem, if I remember correctly. Maybe I'm misusing I this. That's but it. It, I mean, I don't know for sure that you're conscious. I'm doing some uh, um, uh, extrapolation here. I'm saying I am conscious and you're built very similarly. Uh, I could similar be your brain, simulation, so you though. Yeah, it's true. And, uh, you could be uh, simulating me. <laughs> or, or, yeah, or you could be a zombie. And uh, it's, <laughs> um, so this is already a complicated, just seeing that we have consciousness in other people and then going to animals or AI, or uh, that's, that's of course, super hard. And But if, we, if maybe we should, sticking to humans, that's also something that's plagued consciousness research because it's so unreliable. You have to, have to, to believe people to know they're conscious of something. So everything has to be questions and can't be really a... Uh, just automatic measures because we know we can have a uh, reaction times to, to things that we're not conscious of. Um, but this makes it all very subjective, which is something that uh, scientists try to avoid for a lot of time. So, um, so it's just, it's, it's a problem from that. Well, let, let's come back to the human world of consciousness. And then it, it, towards the end, we'll go back out there because there's so much to explore. So in your study, you looked at uh, four different, I mean, you looked at multiple regions of the brain, but you looked at four specific regions and you got to use a really unique testing group. So I, I really like it if you could just explain yeah, the was... testing group and the areas that you looked at and why this was such a great model and was. Okay, your paper's awesome. <laughs> uh, a great model system to look at and do measurements in. Um, cool. So maybe I want to start by saying this is exactly the place to, to credit my co-authors. So, I, I mean, my advisor, Leon, is also very instrumental to this paper and to conceiving the old paradigm, but also to the fine grained analysis. Um, and the data collection was actually done uh, with the second author, Eden Gilbert, and uh, Professor Bob Knight from UC Berkeley. Um, so he is the one that has really a massive, uh, uh, massive uh, uh, edifice for collecting data from a lot of patients, which I'll describe in a moment. So this is a good place to stop and credit them. Okay. Um, so maybe... Um, I'll say, so in human neuroscience, there's broadly speaking, most of the time you hear about two different types of uh, neuroimaging methods, methods to see what's going on in the brain. One is fMRI. That's like MRI that's being done to diagnose uh, various uh, problems, but also shows a uh, blood flow. And then it shows where, which regions of the brain are more active. So that has very, very good spatial resolution. Like you can say a lot about the specific region active, but the temporal resolution exactly when something was active is really hard to say. Um, so that's on one side. Uh, and a lot of labs around the world use fMRI. The other side is EEG, or sometimes you also hear about MEG, and that's a electrocorticography. That's putting essentially electrodes on the scalp uh, and recording activity like that. So then you know maybe vaguely where you put the electrode, but it's still very far from the brain. You're recording something, you know it's from the brain, you have millisecond resolution or, or even less if you want. So it's very precise in time, very bad in space. Um, and then we were very fortunate to have the opportunity to merge these two. And I think this is where the, the true power of this method comes in. And this is done using patients uh, undergoing surgery for epilepsy. So uh, today there are uh, there is medicine for epilepsy, but I, in a lot of patients it just doesn't work. Um, and there is a surgery that's 
really more and more precise, so more and more people are being referred to it, uh, to just destroy the location in the brain that's causing epilepsy. So epilepsy, you could really think of it as something discharging randomly in, 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 in various problems. You have to have epilepsy that comes from a specific locus, and there's a lot to make sure that it's not coming from a region where we might do damage to important cognitive uh, faculties. Uh, but a lot of patients are going through this route, um, more uh, in the States today, but also in, in Europe a lot, and in, they're starting also in Israel. So they're, and mapping, in the so they're mapping where the uh, disorder is happening, and if it's happening in a small enough region that is likely not to impair cognition significantly, then they just zap or remove that small region that was misfiring for any number of reasons. Exactly. Yeah. And it's amazing how much this improves quality of life. I think the um, the best example is that I did hear a, a, one of the doctors that's really uh, related to doing these studies that his grandson had epilepsy and they were almost immediately considering to do this surgery. So that, that was my personal indication that this is very, very good surgery. In the end, they didn't do it, but uh, I think it, 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 it was because it did get stabilized on drugs. Um, but in many cases, it improves quality of life dramatically. Um, but there is, a, so it's complicated surgery, of course, it's brain surgery. And, and there's dangerous. another stage here that's even more complicated than some other neurosurgeries. Uh, because as I said, if you put electrodes on the head, you know more or less region. So you, you can see the problematic epileptic activity from the scalp, but you can't localize it precisely. Of course, you want to know as precise as possible what you're taking out. So this is a two-stage process. First, there is an operation to just based on the information from uh, outside to put as many electrodes as possible, more or less, inside the brain, um, just to give it as detailed information as possible. So you can't do it everywhere. That's why you start with some basic mapping, uh, but you put a lot in. It could be 100 uh, electrodes um, in some cases. In some cases, you need less because you have better uh, resolution. Um, uh, I think even more than 100 in many cases. Um, and then you wait a few days. Sometimes this can be up to even a, a few weeks because you want the patient actually to have seizures and, and actually to have as many as possible so you can localize precisely where the problem is. And then you do the surgery where you can take care of the problem and remove the electrodes. So we come in in this window in the middle where patients uh, are sometimes very frustrated with waiting for seizures. And a lot of times, actually, this is and you, you go off work and there is no uh, uh, hard duties at home and stuff like that. And people are in a very relaxed situation. So sometimes this actually takes time. They, they, on their everyday life, they might have a seizure every two days and then suddenly they, they wait a week and there's no seizures. Um, but then they're just waiting in the hospital and they kindly agree to take part in studies and it's explained to them. Um, so this study, it's not, we didn't just come and say this is about consciousness because people immediately have the condition. Oh, it's very, very relevant. And I think it's, it is important to say that the direct relevant, this is abstract science and it's not going to directly now improve the health of any patient. So they know they're just contributing to science. Um, and a lot of times they're still there. They're happy to help and just do studies, do various uh, cognitive tasks, uh, view images, hear words, whatever you ask them to do. Um, and then you record the data because you're already recording it. You're waiting for seizures constantly. Um, and then we have data that is from electrodes or so electrical activity, not an MRI machine. So it's really good in time. And it's also from inside the brain. So you know exactly where you recorded. So this is where we came in because in consciousness, there's a lot of debate. There's debates about the temporal aspects and about the spatial aspects. And one unique thing of our work in our work was that we were able to merge. We we're like, we have this tool where we have both space and time. Let's see what we can do now. And then, so you looked at, just so everybody knows, you looked at two sensory regions, which were visual. And then you looked at two regions in the cortex, which are presumed to be where conscious processing goes on. Isn't that so, kind of what the thought is? I mean, you explain it. 
Um, yeah, so thank you for saying. So we looked at um, most of the paper. We divide the brain actually pretty roughly into ROIs. Um, and I'll explain in a moment why one division here is especially crucial. So we have just six broad regions, also based on where we had the electrodes, because the electrodes are placed just based on the clinical needs. You want to find the, the source of the, uh, the seizure. I should also say that after it's localized, it, it, the information is passed to the researchers. So we're not using a, a, like a, an electrode that was placed over a bad tissue, tissue that was epileptic, to uh, say something about the brain more generally. So we're looking at electrodes away from this region. Um, so we, uh, all the regions that we looked at were in the cortex. So you said that the higher order regions, they're both in the cortex and the visual regions. Um, Cause a lot of vision, uh, a lot of the cortex is dedicated to processing vision. Um, and this is very tough computation. So it's done uh, also in the cortex. Um, so one region, a, a sensor region was just the occipital cortex. That's like the first cortical uh, station where visual information comes to the brain. So it's funny for people who don't know that this is in the back of your head. This is why uh, teachers in kindergarten tell you not to go back on your uh, like uh, flip with your chair because you can really end up blind. Um, yes. And then there's more advanced processing. So you said recognition earlier, you said, and so where does the understanding not just of lines and basic shapes happen, but what am I looking at? Something like it, as complex as a face, for example, that happens further downstream in an area that's like kind of in, in the neck kind of, kind of oh, like not in that, like eh, below where I can point. Um, so this is the second visual region that we looked at. And the other two regions, so one is really important, that's the prefrontal cortex. And that's kind of the, it's very famous. It's where a lot of a, a very advanced cognitive things go on. Um, it's a, also a, the region that's most different in size between humans and other mammals, for example. Um, so that's, a, you could call it a more executive high order region. I wouldn't necessarily want to say in advance, this is where consciousness is. Some theories say that, but we actually try to be very theory neutral. And I, I do resonate with that. I think our theories are important to get the experiments going, but we're in a very premature stage. Um, so no theory can claim too much empirical support at this point. Um, so that was one region. And then another region that some theories also speculate about, this, this parietal cortex. Um, this is also about like executive functions, um, a bit less debated than the prefrontal. Okay. Thank you for a great description. Now I'm going to give you kind of a tough one because before we get into the results, because you use some really cool statistics and uh, models to present your data. And the one that I really loved was the space state trajectories. I found them to be extremely informative in reading the manuscript and understanding what was going on. So, and then of course you use multivariate decoding and uh, uh, exemplar information. So these are all like important to understanding how you derived your results. So did you just sit down with your advisor? Like how, how did you come up with deciding these are the tools that I need to use to analyze the data? So um, I, I guess it, this connects to what I said er, uh, earlier in our discussion. So I came from mathematics um, and I'm in a computational neuroscience program. So I think the a set of mathematical tools was like, it was constantly in my toolkit. So, um, and I think that's a benefit if we go to, to learning a lot of things that you don't really understand at that point, why you need them. The fact that you can think of them when the time comes is really crucial. So that was something, a lot of these methods, a lot came from my advice, but a lot also came from me and methods that I uh, developed. Nice. Um, and I think the broader uh, thing that happened, so there was an earlier study with this data in our lab that was led by Eden Gerber, uh, the second author of the paper. And he looked at single electrodes and then uh, he found some uh, things, but the next natural step, and this is also corresponding to, uh, I guess, uh, an understanding that's broader out there in neuroscience, not just related to consciousness, things are really happening in the network. So even if we're trying to localize things and saying like prefrontal and sensory areas, it might be a network and sensory area 
areas or network in the prefrontal cortex that involves a lot of uh, regions and activity from multiples there. So it was really important from the start, and this is something that my advisor pretty much said, let's, let's look at this with multivariate methods. And then he kind of gave me a very free hand in what multivariate methods to use. So this is essentially, you said state space. So what we're doing kind of is instead of looking just at one electrode, and if you think of a graph, this is like a, we're just looking at activity and time, we look at multiple electrodes together. So we think of this abstract space, that's the state space you described, that each axis is the activity in a different electrode. And now you can really plot the activity. So at a single time point, it, you just look at a activity in every electrode and you have one point. And then it, time go, goes on, so you have another point another point another point and you can draw these lines these trajectories in state space that I, i'm really happy you enjoyed them so much because they were really something that people use a lot in your science but almost or even not at all in the consciousness research field or in in humans and in cognitive neuroscience in general um, and i thought it was really important and really cool to bring it to uh, to to people's minds to see that this is really helpful a lot of times just in interpreting your decoding or results or other analysis. So decoding and the exemplar analysis, some of them were just known in the field. They, there are like open reviews about them. Um, and I think that the novelty here was kind of combining everything and doing it. I think reading the paper, you kind of see the same conclusions over and over again. And that was really cool to us to just show it from all directions, but really get to the same main point. Yeah. I mean, because the state those lines and the shapes they take allow you to, because we're pattern-seeking creatures, it allows you to really see the patterns and how they correlate in the measurements that you took. And it makes it very compelling because it's, a, it's statistically relevant and significant. And then the exemplar information, maybe you could explain what an exemplar is a little bit and why because that's kind of the crux of everything at the end uh what what it enables you to measure uh, yeah so thank you so in our study uh, i think we already mentioned it that this is about the visual consciousness and what you're a uh, so it's what you're seeing i mentioned earlier that the neural mechanism for seeing a face versus seeing a watch um so that's the broad question that we're looking at but then this was actually the specific comparison that we worked on in most of the study. Um, it's a lot of times it's something that's compared exactly because you have a very different experience, but a lot of the low level features like the roundness and things that look like eyes and nose are shared actually in people and watches. Um, but then when I'm conscious now, when I'm looking at your face, I'm not just seeing a face generally, I'm seeing your face, I'm seeing random. So I think that's uh, the, what we're actually interested in consciousness. So there is something, uh, this is, can also be debated how much it's cognitive inference versus your raw experience. But I think that it, it is agreed that a lot of your basic experience already includes some, uh, some things that are a bit more interpretive. So I think I'm seeing a face, but I'm seeing Randon's face. So the specificity within the category, this is the exemplar analysis. Got you. Makes it very clear. So here we go. What did you find? Tell me. Cool. So, <laughs> <laughs> so first, I, I love this because this is so different than how we do like an abstract and present it in an academic talk, because usually you start with a paradigm there and here we're getting to it so late and got all this background, which I think is really helpful. And I think maybe we should try it out also in academic conferences. Um, so the question, so I kept, I said we were looking at space and we were looking at time. Um, I should say this is exactly where it's one study and the interpretation is essentially connected to everything else that's going on. It's not only for me. We actually never had the comparison of uh, seeing, like having the same objective stimulus in front of your face, but sometimes you see it and sometimes not. This is the standard uh, uh, contrastive method that's used in all uh, consciousness research. And it's crucial. Uh, so what I'll just explain briefly. So for example, you have people looking at a screen, brief flash of a face, and then you put a lot of dots and things like that are on it and then in very you you do everything very precisely and then people can say for exactly the same uh, visual stimulus sometimes they say oh i saw it i saw a face and sometimes they say i don't i just saw lines i didn't see anything um, and then you contrast these two states so this was super useful and it's it, it's essential to say something in the end about consciousness and not just about visual processing 
And we wanted to still say something about consciousness, but depart from that. So this was the basic idea that my advisor had already uh, many years ago, um, because I should say collecting the uh, patient data that we have took a lot of years as well. Um, oh, sure. He said, okay, we're like everything going on in the field is flashes, but we experience things for longer times. So I'm looking at you now and I keep seeing a face, at least introspectively. It seems to me that I'm, I'm still seeing you. And if I look at you and move my eyes immediately, then the experience, it should differ. So he was really eager to look at these regions where you present exactly the same stereo. So random space, random space. But in one case, you leave it on for a few seconds. And in the other case, you take it on directly. Immediately, sorry. So we, this is what we did. We just showed people images. We and we assume that they're all conscious, but they're in different durations, and we compare them. And so here, I'll first I'll explain the results, assuming that we're really conscious throughout the entire time. But I want to already say there's a complication here that I really uh, do believe in. So I I think we have to uh, get to that too. Hey, we're, so you have you have the floor for as long as you need it. <laughs> <laughs> you you might regret that. <laughs> no. <laughs> Uh, okay, so we're showing people these images, uh, just different categories, different exemplars, as I said, so different faces, different watches. We also showed the animals and other things, and um, just different durations. So the main comparison of the paper is between something that you would see for two seconds or that you were shown for two seconds or, or a second and a half in our case, and something that was shown for just 300 milliseconds, so more like a flash. It's a bit longer than a flash, but still pretty short. Um, and we were interested in seeing first what regions say the content of the stimulus in this case. So what is, we said some region the brain has to say, this is a face, this is a watch. Where is this going on? Um, and this we found in posterior regions, so in the, uh, the sensory regions that I described. I keep using a lot of words to describe the same things. This is sensory. This is the visual regions. It was present bo in both of the regions more strongly and more stable in the areas that are uh, for more advanced visual processing. And this we showed when I, I just said now the information or what you're looking at. This exactly we showed with all these advanced methods of showing of both the category level and the exemplar level. Um, and this was really something that corresponded to the duration of the stimulus. So if you saw the image or if the image was on for a second and a half, you had something a bit longer than a second and a half in that region, neural activity that says, I'm looking at a face now, I'm looking at a watch now. If it was just 300 milliseconds, this was a lot shorter. It was same, same activity, but a lot shorter. Um, and this is actually, so even if we ignore all the consciousness implications, this is already important for vision research. It, just because for convenience, pretty much all the studies use very short stimuli. So the 300 milliseconds, which sounds ridiculous saying it in everyday life, like this is an hour long podcast, 300 milliseconds is pretty much the standard duration, just to save time. People- Oh, are, we're like, likely to bust an hour by far. I think we're going long beyond an hour. <laughs> so it just like, so uh, all this uh, impatience we see is, is also in research. People would just come to the lab. They want to do an experiment. And they came to do that, but they, they have limited attention. So the researcher wants to flash as many images as possible for a limited time. Um, so it became the standard to do very short images. But then since our everyday experience is more than that, the question was just what happens afterwards? Even if we're not talking about this distinction, conscious, non-conscious, how is this coded? So the earlier study with this data um, showed in single electrodes that you have this rise ton of activity in the beginning of the stimulus, like when there's a sharp change. And then even if the stimulus is still there, it goes down very dramatically. Also in regions that are historically and, and empirically known to a code for faces, for example. So this was very puzzling, and this is, was actually the reason to go to this multivariate method to see, okay, single electrodes might not have enough activity to keep this, but is the network showing it? It is like the region in general. So this is the, the found, finding there in visual regions. But then, and this was really uh, something that I wanted to add um, because of this relevant to consciousness, we want to see what happens in a more frontal or parietal regions. So we're thinking we're still conscious of things. So if, if, I mean, now if we're putting on our consciousness research hat, we say at least there's a lot of theories that say this is really important. Um, maybe to, to drop a few names. So there is high order theories. Uh, Haku and Lau is a proponent of these mostly. A lot of other people have variants. Um, and the idea there is basically that you have to have, you have some representation of the image, but you have to, to re-represent it. This is usually in prefrontal cortex to be conscious of it. 
Um, so this is one example of the, a theory that is really important for uh, the, the prefrontal cortex is really crucial for it. Um, and then others, there's a lot of debate about it in the field. A lot of people were saying all these prefrontal findings and studies are just artifacts of tasks. So this was something that's very contested in, in the field and we wanted to check it. And then we saw that there is and that there is information there, which was really cool because our coverage actually is very, very low in prefrontal cortex. So the study was really designed for these sensory areas and we barely had patients with electrodes in the prefrontal cortex. Um, but still we had some, and we found a very strong, clear signal, but this was not something that tracked the duration of the stimulus. So it was clear and strong, but after a few hundred milliseconds, it went down and there was no longer information about what image is being shown. So if I kept looking at a face or I'm looking, I well, have a water was it, glass here. Well, is it that there was still no information or that the information's just been passed on and that area is no longer needed to maintain that information in the working, in your working experience? So I think two things. So first, um, so we're talking about information in this region. If there is still information somewhere else, which we know there is, we showed it in sensory regions. Right. So, it, it, um, and this could be part of the explanation. Exactly. The prefrontal cortex might get the information when it's crucial. So when a change happened, but then it's not crucial anymore. It's just code for like for changes more. Um, and we, going back to the question about definition of consciousness. So some people will say, okay, that's what like if something is important to you, something that's task relevant, that's already the same as consciousness. That that's what we need to define. And some people say that this is completely the wrong definition. So this is where I'm hesitant about defining it because it, we, we're trying to describe what we found. We found that the prefrontal cortex only codes for changes. You can say, now, wait, this is not enough for consciousness, or it is enough. And this is where I want to go back to that. Or it's, that just, or it's just a part of, because I think that it's, or it's just a part of, because all, what you're saying is that the, the visual sensory region is working as a continual sensor, but also could be working as a hard drive, essentially, or... RAM, yeah. it's working as ran, RAM for the frontal cortex. And so when the, I can draw from it, yeah, I can draw I like from this. it at need. Because you said also it's working as a sensory apparatus, but actually this is not the first station of processing visual information. You have first, you have information already processed in your eyes and your retinas, and then in subcortical regions, and only then it comes there. And also what we found is mainly for this downstream region. So not early visual cortex, higher order visual cortex. So you could have a, a, that, that part is more about keeping the information going on, corresponding to the sensory stimulus, but it doesn't necessarily have to be conscious. Um, and that's where I think it's really uh, uh, connected to a very interesting idea. Also exactly talking about like going with the spirit of, of putting out their novel ideas. So it's not something that our study shows necessarily, but I think this brings us, um, to, we have to also think of the option that we're really not conscious between these gaps, that we're just filling in the gaps. Uh, and there is some research to suggest this too. Not that was in your paper solution. and I found yeah. that fascinating and I went and read a little bit about it with the uh, blinking spheres. Yeah. Maybe you could explain that because it, it, yeah, that's so, wild. Yeah, I, I think so too. <laughs> Thank you. So um, instead it's taking like being, I, I want to be an honest scientist. I want to emphasize this is not something that we show in the paper, but it, it just, it brings it, uh, it's relevant to it and says we should keep considering this option. So the idea here is basically that we're not continuously aware, like uh, the, maybe a lot of people think subjectively, introspectively, and this might be sort of filling in. So it might be that you're aware of these like small jumps of 300, 400 milliseconds, maybe a bit more, maybe a bit less. And you, you just, you don't know. It's so short. If you try to measure it, what happens in between, that you never really realize that you weren't aware in between them. Because if something happens, I mean, soon enough, you, you, you'll get to a window of awareness and you'll become aware of it. Um, and still super debated, maybe like things going on outside, change also the frequency of the windows and things like that. This is super broad field. In these theories of so it's not continuous it's discrete perception um, and i think it's it's a viable option and actually the strongest evidence to suggest this comes from behavioral studies um, so we just measured things in the pfc and said hey maybe maybe we're just conscious there um, 
So do you, do you want me? Uh, okay. So um, this so one really cool phenomenon that is related to this, um, and at least suggestive of this type of perception, it's called the color five phenomenon. And what happens there is essentially uh, you show people very briefly, you flash a disc, you flash another disc, and you, you'll see that if you flash two discs, people, you will see that, you'll feel that it's one disc moving between two places. Um, but then what happens just in the first time, if I flash and then I flash again, um, the brain doesn't, like, without any prior information, you don't know that there's going to be another disc. So there has to be filling in for all these slots in the middle. When you, afterwards, you see it as if it moved. But when that actually happened, you had no way of knowing that there was going to be even another disc or it could be there. And then the strongest version of it is just changing color also. So you have one flash that's blue and one flash that's uh, red, for example. And then what people actually see is a change of color in the middle. But when the disc was in the middle, you, you didn't see the color yet. How You couldn't know it. It has to be a retrospective feeling in. I'm going to try and find a video and embed that in this for the color fi so people can see what we're talking about. So I, I actually... So apparent motion in general might be easier to find, but Colorfy is like the specific version with colors, but I think it's cool. If you find it, that will be awesome. If I can find it. I actually yeah. have uh, my own experience with this or my own experiment that I've done in six or seven years ago. Uh, and you'll find it interesting, I think, because uh, one of the things that's come out in the last four or five years with all the new fMRI technology is what's going on in the brain under the influence of psychedelics like LSD. And one of the things that was shown is that there's certainly an increase in the frequency, brainwave frequency and brainwave activity. And it's in all over the brain, not just in a couple areas, it, it goes everywhere. So I tried this experiment three times. And every time it worked. And this is, if you, a fluorescent light cycles at 60 hertz. So you can't really see that it's flickering. You can't see it with under normal circumstances. It just looks like light. If you are under the influence of LSD, you can, it looks like it's a disco light because you can absolutely discern the, the rate that it's cycling. And it's crystal clear. It's not even like you have to try to see it. It literally looks that way. And if you tap it out, you can get to the 60 Hertz. That's the measurement that I did. So, so clearly there may be gaps that we are filling in and that when you ramp up your brain frequency that then you can also decrease the amount of time that you're filling in yeah that that's that's super cool um and, and that was a really good example with the light I, you also see it just in in TV or now even all over the internet, you get constant frames and I see you as in front of me and I notice also when it becomes too large and it becomes jittery, um, but we always fill in. So the, the importance here is that the resolution of so 60 hertz is, is very high. And these discrete uh, perception theories talk about things a lot lower, more like a, a between I don't know, two and 10 hertz. So think, going from that resolution, saying people uh, agree that we fill in at this rate uh, between uh, two pulses in 60 hertz, but 10 hertz is a lot more time uh, because it means uh, like one frame every 100 milliseconds. That's, it feels a lot, and yet it also feels short. So I think that's the main reason it's contested. It's not very, very brief filling in. It's relatively large compared to the effect that you describe now. I think it, it still, it doesn't disqualify it. It just means that it's weird in that sense. It's like it's more than filling in for a, a continuous light because it's just so much further apart. Yeah, I, I don't know where I stand on that yet. Like, I don't have a fully formed idea on... And I think that's great too. I think that that's something that we should be able to say. It's just, I mean, 
especially I think about consciousness, but also in other fields, just bringing up the possibilities and the options is okay. And you don't necessarily have to cut them down and, and believe in one thing, because you just don't have a way of knowing now. From your mouth to the rest of the world's ears. I hope <laughs> they hear that one. Uh, yeah. Cause if it's, it almost seems like it has to be filling in because even though we experience at a continuous rate, uh, because of these things that we have measured, that it seems like there has to be a certain amount of filling in. Yet, when it comes to other things, conscious things, like certain reflex reactions, but conscious ones, where in my peripheral vision, there's a baseball coming at my head, right? So everybody's seen this, like, a video of somebody at a baseball park where they're not paying attention to the game and a foul ball is hit and somehow they wham and they grab it and they actually catch it. Okay. And it, it looks unbelievable, you know, but that's, that's what happened. That's well, a great example of unconscious processing. And like going back to what we discussed about bees and things like that, it, you have to remember that really, really complicated stuff can happen when you're unconscious. I mean, just the amount of time it takes people to become aware that you flash the stimulus in front of them is too long. You have to do, you have already executed the moment in the movement when you, you are become aware of it. So it has to be unconscious. Or, because this is where it's like, now we're splitting hairs a little bit because... I would still consider that to be conscious because you peripheral vision. Okay. It's not in your direct focus. However, you're, you are sensing it and you're reacting to it. And you took this complicated uh, measurement and you had to do serious calculations to get the math right to catch the ball on the trajectory it's on. And uh, what am I trying to say? That that the I think you're trying like the, well, the, the speed of it is faster it? than neuronal firing in in this type of a case because till you recognize it in your peripheral vision, it's already close. So you have how long to react? A couple hundred milliseconds, half a second at the most. And yet you've done all of these things and it happens. So are we processing at a subconscious level, which is still conscious, right? Do you consider subconscious conscious? So I think that's a matter of definition. I think exactly what you said. So it's, it, I, I don't know if I would consider it conscious, but just you said it's not exactly, we didn't recognize it. We're not aware of it. But there is processing there. So subconscious in, in many fields, that's like a synonym of unconscious. But I think there is a valid case to be made that you should still consider that as consciousness of a different form. Um, and maybe um, if I understood correctly, when you start describing it, you're talking actually about the difference between attention and consciousness. You're saying I was yeah. not okay, so that it, is actually I was what we're saying. processing it. And so that's it, that's just like putting a bit of... of terms to describe what you said, but I think uh, the, the beginning of the description at least really resonated with me on that. Um, and there's, uh, so initially I think people tend, and a lot of times neuroscientists or psychologists even not from the field tend to equate these two and think, well, okay, you're conscious of what you are attending, you're attending what you're conscious, but there is really cool, sophisticated studies showing that these two things are separate. So exactly this is your case. So we might still be processing the ball. It might, and sorry, not just processing. We might be aware of it, but not attending it. And I think there are cases like that and cases like that. So in this case, maybe the reflex is so fast that you weren't even uh, just, you're not processing it fast enough to, to re for it to reach any awareness. Um, um, but maybe it is, I, I don't know. Um, I think both cases exist. I mean, we all see, I don't know, a glass was about to fall at like a dinner party and you, you reached up and you, and you grab the glass bit and you realize you did it only when you have the glass in your hand and, and because you're about just wanting to make sure that it doesn't break. Um, so in some of these cases, I think you're aware of it, but not attending it. And in others, I think you might not even be aware of it. And I, I don't know which is which. Well, 
let's come back to your study for just a second, and then we're going to go back there. So, because I want to, what I really want you to discuss, because this was also an important part of the paper, was that, you know, this is in collaboration with this, in this adversarial, quote unquote, adversarial collaboration cogitate. And the your end results, which were that the, the, the visual processing regions were holding the signal and that the frontal cortex regions were only transiently using the signal or holding the signal. And this kind of seemed to, the way you described it, at least in part, resolve this adversarial nature of this collaboration, or at least open a door to resolution. So maybe you could discuss like what it is. And... Yeah, so, so that's a really big topic. I'll start by saying we are not part of this collaboration. So this is an important point. Um, we, uh, and I think in this case, I felt at least personally that it allowed me to, to um, um, get to conclusions faster. So uh, this study design, just the showing multiple durations, um, it was already uh, ran in our, our lab or more precisely in Bob Nice lab in 2012, if I remember correctly, or something along that range. So about a decade ago. Um, and so my advisor worked on it and we already had a study published with it. And then uh, this adversarial collaboration saw this design and said, this could be cool, this could be relevant for theories of consciousness. Um, let's adopt it. And they, they made some cool adjustments. I, I can elaborate more about uh, task relevance, though maybe it's not that crucial for now. Um, so we were able after that, uh, just because we already had the, the design and they actually borrowed this design and were inspired by it uh, and, and developed it, we were able to answer a lot of the predictions that they put out there and, and test them in our data, uh, even though we're not officially part of the collaboration. Um, though now I can say I can already talk relatively confidently about what we found because now they already finished analyzing their first experiment as well. And this was uh, all over the place, even New York Times reported it and everyone. Um, our paper is already published in peer reviews. Theirs is not, but the conclusions are actually really similar. Um, so um, when I wrote this originally, it was before they reached their final conclusion. So it is important to say that this is not something official from that collaboration and that they should speak for themselves. Um, but just because they adopted and adapted our paradigm, we had we were fortunate enough to be able to test these predictions. So this is where really where I should thank them for clarifying the link between this study that's presumably just about visual perception and not about consciousness and showing how intimately related it is with, with theories of consciousness. So that's really on, on them. And I, I thank them for doing that. They, and they made clear this connection and they published the predictions ahead of time, not the analysis are only recently uh, out there. It's a preprint, but the, the predictions were published. Um, and so we just want to send, and this was actually something that confused us because the name is adversarial collaboration. And then when we tested the prediction, we were like, wait, both of the, the core predictions of both theories materialize. Um, they have more detail because our study was not about this adversarial collaboration. So it's, I think it's in the end, just one or two paragraphs in the discussion. Um, so they have a lot more nuanced discussion of what did pass and what not. But essentially, they reached the same conclusion. So actually, from the start, from the design, both theories have merits. Um, and I think what you said is actually what we should take merit. So what we said is like, just notice everyone, you're not going to get a, a solution from this. Like, because it kind of can just the name uh, does suggest that. And what I wanted to say, and this goes back to what I said earlier, I think it might be too early to to cancel some theories. Uh, and and just it's, we, we don't know enough. Um, and in this case, it showed that um, it's still advanced. They're, they have a very large data set now. They made the, the connection clear. Um, and it, it did advance the discussion in the field, uh, but they didn't get to a clear resolution as some might have hoped before we published it. Um, so this was what we said, and it was more like a, a warning. Uh, people like notice this is good. And I think this is pretty much already right. like this is there's this collaboration. It's a, it, it has its advantages, but it's not going to get us to a final resolution. We might have to take some parts of the, each theory, or each theory is going to have to continue developing, um, and then we might be able to say more. But for now, this it's kind of at an impasse. Well, I agree that we're in the unknown, but I don't think that the quote unquote, hard problem of consciousness is going to be solved in the next six months or a year, or perhaps not even in your lifetime. So, because it's so difficult to pin down, we can barely put words together that actually start to define it. 
And if you can't even put words to it, it makes it even harder to study. So that's a really good point. I think here I, I diverge from saying anything related to the, the paper and just say my own opinion. So first you said half a year, a year, I think everyone agrees that's too soon. No one's going to solve any problem there. Um, then we started to think, what does it even mean to solve the hard problem um, and what will happen within our lifetimes or not? And for me personally, this is just my personal view, what I actually aim for is more to, to take out the mystery out of it, to make it something that would, to get as close as I can, uh, because I think that some of the questions that we feel are so deep and so uh, untractable by the tools of science might be more of a, a just as a meta problem just we have these intuitions that there is a deep consciousness but maybe once we study it more we realize it's not that mysterious um, and actually similar phenomenon happened uh, regarding life itself so if you go 100 or 200 years back there was this concept uh, um, the elan vital or I, I hope i'm not butchering the french pronunciation of it um, which was like the sort of a magical substance that gives you life and then when biology got closer and closer to understanding it, people kind of realized it's not a problem anymore. It just became less and less mysterious and, and better and better defined. And it wasn't necessarily one key moment. It was a gradual process. Um, and I think some people, there's still good, valid arguments that this is not comparable enough to consciousness. That's like the most fundamental thing that we can know. But my personal inclination is to say that my hope and what I want to contribute to is getting consciousness research to a similar place, to just get it demystified, to bring more and more data and more and more theories and just get it more and more in the mainstream of what we're allowed to study scientifically. And then some of the mystery will already, by this action, kind of vanish. But that's well, just... <laughs> I, well, let me ask you then a question that maybe is part of why we have so much mystery behind it. And that is... Do you think that the electric fields that are in our brain are part and parcel of the conscious of consciousness? Because we talk about neurons and what they do, and we talk about the activity in brain waves, but there are electric fields all through our brain around every cell within cells. And those are moving at the speed of light or near the speed of light so is this <clears throat> is this part potentially part of consciousness and is that part of potentially demystifying <clears throat> pardon me part of demystifying the rate at which we experience because if we have if there's electric fields that are also part of the transmission of consciousness then you would everything would seem practically instantaneous for from an experience standpoint so that's a really good question i might i don't know that's the basic answer i think in the more mundane sense there is definitely relevance to electric fields because electric fields change the, uh, the uh, resting potential of neurons uh, and then this changes how fast they can fire and things like that and um, so even the most conventional theories within mainstream neuroscience think that the firing of neurons is crucial so electric fields are at the very least super relevant in that sense um, whether they are themselves maybe part of the NCC or part of consciousness, I don't know. I, I really, I have no idea. I, I mean, I would be interested to see evidence to, to either case. Well, there's, so uh, I interviewed Dimitri Panosis from MIT uh, about a month ago, and he has a paper out, which I can send you, I'll which, is, really happy which is, a ma <clears throat> which mathematically models uh, the electric fields from very similar type of data as you collected in your study. It was just done in primates as opposed to humans. So I would be really, really happy to see that. I didn't know it. I know the, uh, of uh, his work, but maybe older studies, I, I would be really happy. This is like new, new. It came out in the last you know few months. That, and, that's uh, kind of you to give me this justification, but I should be more up to my reading. <laughs> well, I also have been reading a lot to just to be able to keep up with uh, you, <laughs> you young sprites that are out there making all this uh, crazy new research. <laughs> so uh, let me let me pose this to you. This is a well, actually, let's start here. 
AI, do you think that all of this hubbub about AI starting to become conscious is a uh, reality or is, is this just clickbait that the, all of these tech companies are trying to push on people? And I'll give my opinion too, but I want to hear your opinion first. Um, so I'm curious about your opinion. I, I can understand in the middle. I think it's not, we're not there yet, but I think it is important to talk about. So some of the discussion has been total clickbait, but some has been more serious. For example, there's a pretty recent preprint that a lot of authors were on it that basically doesn't come up with a final, final solution. I actually didn't finish reading the preprints, but from the part that I read it already, um, they, they just survey theories of consciousness and survey kind of, uh, basic architectures of AI that is out there and say the relevance from this theory to, uh, uh, to the AI. So just starting to map out this interaction more precisely, I think is crucial. So I think the effort in this preprint is wonderful. Um, it, but so I, I am pro at least some of the discussion on this, but a lot of it has been clickbait. I think that uh, it's 99% clickbait. And the reason I feel that way is that, and this also like comes from the, that newborn study really made me even cement this idea more in my head that, you know, infants part of them becoming self-aware is that they can move things in their environment and that they know that they are the actor moving the things in their environment. It's a really cool new study, but I don't think that consciousness can be obtained by any type of artificial intelligence without the ability to manipulate its environment, without the ability to manipulate its environment then it and i'm not talking about a computer environment of ones and zeros i'm talking about the environment that it cannot become aware because how would you know that you exist unless you can interact and you say well you can interact through a keyboard and someone talking to you maybe but it does it, that's like if all you could do was hear, if that was the only sense you have, what what kind of a distorted sense of consciousness would that be? So it might be distorted, but that, I don't think it means it's not there. But I think I, I do, I resonate with this view. So there's more and more talk about like embodied cognition and also embodied consciousness that is really related to your interaction with the environment and to having a body. I think that's really interesting in the sense that you, to learn to be conscious, you might have to have these things. But I'll try to give you maybe a thought experiment that if I take now and we, we understand all the neurons and we can map it out completely to, to a computer, and I have some a, a new technology that enabled me to take the state your brain is in now and just directly implement it in a computer. Um, would that be conscious or not? I think if it's exactly the same state of, of the brain, then I would personally think it is, but then it, it doesn't necessarily have any of the interactions. But this is kind of cheating because you learn to be conscious in your body and then it's just copying that. So I think it, it might require this distinction between being conscious and learning and building consciousness. Maybe learning is a bit vague on that like and, and becoming conscious. I in that mind experiment, I can totally see your point. If you've already been experienced, then perhaps, yes, you could do a kind of transfer like that. And it would be maintained because of the structures already been built. So maybe, but, you know, there is an area of physics that believe that the most un- Indivisible, the most indivisible thing in physical reality is consciousness. And therefore, consciousness may underpin everything. That consciousness may be what the universe is ultimately made of. And all matter and all aspects of the universe are conscious. And that we're just antennas for these consciousness. And this gets back into... It's kind of why I think about electric fields, because electric fields can interact not only within our body, but also outside our body. And 
interact with the electric fields that we encounter all the time. Um, I mean, it's that's a wild idea. Yeah, I think. But there are physicists that actually, you know, real physicists that subscribe that this is a real possibility. There's also so people there, that think- it goes back a lot more years than that because this, if I understand correctly, this is a version of idealism. There's like you have materialism or physicalism; they're a bit distinct. But putting that on the side of where a lot of scientists would argue, like it's it's material stuff and consciousness is built from that, maybe and and arguing about subtypes there. And then you could go to the other extreme and say all there is is consciousness, is awareness, and everything is actually constructed from that. And you also have this version in the middle that's panpsychism that says like for basic particles, you have both this and this, uh, but it's not uh, in extreme. Um, I think it's interesting. I definitely, I, I mean, I would be, ha- I, I'm like curious what these people think. I would be very eager to hear talks about that. Uh, but my personal inclination is probably towards the materialist physical side more. Um, but I, I mean, I'm, I don't think we have enough information to rule it out. That's that's a that's a fair answer. I can I can send you a couple of links to a few things that you, can, that you can look at. And like I've just been trying to keep now that I'm not pinned to academic science, I've been just been trying to keep an open mind about everything to be as open as and you know maybe sometimes that's too open, and that's okay too because. As long as you hold the philosophy of when presented with better data, you upgrade your philosophy, then everything's fine. And that's, you know, that's why it's like, I feel everything should be published. You know, I'm I'm not a fan of peer review because not, I'm not a fan of peer review from the sense of they get to decide whether it's published or not. I'm a fan of peer review to help you improve the the way your paper's written. But I'm not a fan of it to decide. Actually, in our paper, but I do want to distinguish that. I think um, there's also this model that eLife, the journal, is trying to put out there. And I think it kind of, the the problem is that a lot of the filtering is happening at the the stage of the editor. Um, uh, So just deciding whether to send something to peer review or not. Um, And I think maybe people that had other peer review experience will say there's problem, problems there too. But my personal experience with this paper, and you can actually go there, is our preprint and our published paper are very different. The analysis, that the results are almost identical, but like one supplementary figure change or something like that. It was already this comprehensive. Um, but, uh, but the conceptualization and, for example, thinking about these discrete perception theories it really came from taking seriously the review, um, which I, I mean... People out there, if you're the reviewers, I know one of them at least, but like, they, thank you. It was really, really, really constructive. I, but I know I was lucky, so I, I don't well, want to. You're not wrong. That's my point about, like, I love peer review for helping you improve but things should your be paper. out there also if they're weird to people. I think that's, that's a valid and, and really relevant point. I feel like, I don't know, a scientist writing about idealism might get kicked out earlier than peer review. That's what I'm trying to say. I think part of our problem is how much filtering is going on at the editor stage. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I know this is an issue that a lot of people think heavily about. I have, I had like my two cents to, to put in just saying like, I love the peer review of this paper, but it doesn't mean the system works. And, and this, that's my point. It's like, it works kind of, but it also for anything that is extraordinary or is an extraordinarily wild idea, it doesn't work for it all. And I mean, that's really unfortunate because you can still have an extraordinarily wild idea that's completely wrong, influence somebody into the most extraordinarily right idea. And yeah, I, to, I like that. Yeah. So to push those things out of the, the ability of the public to make their own decisions, to just, as a scientist, like, I don't need someone to review for me. I can review for myself. So from that's where instead of instead of peer review, I feel like we should have uh, peer aid and it's literally like no 
the the goal the, is the to just make the project really as good as it can be. To that, I think. Uh, I mean, I'd be curious. I you, you might want to check it out in more detail because maybe I'm misrepresenting what they're doing. But I think you should pitch that name for them. I think what they really did is exactly move to this model of peer aid. Um, the issue maybe is that not everything is still sent to that stage, but everything that passes their editor is now published and with comments. So you can, after the review, you can change your paper completely, or you can just put a rebuttal and put why you think the reviewer was wrong and exactly let people judge it for themselves. So I think that that's really cool. I think they should have a catchy name. So you should definitely reach out. Peer aid is a cool uh, way to, to put it. Well, thank you. And thank you. This has been an awesome experience. Yeah, uh, me too. Thank you. Yeah, you're, you, you're a dynamo. Like, I, love, <laughs> I really enjoyed speaking with you. Let me, let me give you the final question. And this is, this is the hardest one, really. And that is, if, <laughs> if the genie appeared in your office right now and granted you one wish, one, not three, you only get one. What would you use it on? Academic? Like it doesn't have to no, be. No, anything. Anything. Let's put it still in the setting of my office. I would probably ask him for like knowing that there's so much uncertainty in aiming for an academic career. I think uh, now in Israel, like I hear all the time about excellent people with one for PhDs and postdocs that don't find jobs. So I'd be like, just tell me it'll be fine. <laughs> just, I want to keep doing this. Uh, like, just tell me I can keep doing this for life. I will then go eagerly to do it and, and still stick to all the deadlines, do the postdoc, everything. I just want to know that it'll be okay. <laughs> well, I think that in your, at your career stage, that's a pretty good wish. Uh, and I, I would, uh, have a hard time believing that somebody won't snap you right up out of your postdoc <laughs> I, because I mean, it, it, really, <laughs> a really fantastic manuscript. You really well-written it cut. It's very, the tone is not abrasive, but it's also stands up for the work and Thank you. it really reads well, uh, Certainly not for the faint of heart. There's, a, a, it's pretty, it's super technical, but uh, it had to be because you can't do the analysis that you did without being really, really technical. And uh, thank you for your time today. And I wish you all the best. And when you uh, have something else coming out, please contact me. Will do. Thank you so much. So I'm, this is my first podcast and I've enjoyed it a lot. So, um, I mean, I love the premise also of your specific podcast. So just, I really want to thank you for the experience and for doing this. So it's amazing. All right. Well, uh, uh, I hope to run into you from across the world. Talk to you soon. <laughs> thank you. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs>